that. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. There we go. Colossians chapter 3. Oh, I've been looking forward to this. I'll probably make a mess of it. That's usually how it works. Amen. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1, we sing the preeminence of the Son. We got to brag on the Lord for a little while. Paul, I, Paul the, the, I don't believe anybody does it any better than Paul. Paul. Paul exalts the Lord Jesus Christ above everything. And he is. Right. And he is. So we sing the preeminence of the Son. Then in chapter 2, we see the position in the Savior, we're in Christ, amen? <coughs> Excuse me. And here in chapter 3, we're going to have a, we're going to see the passing away to sin. The passing away to sin. Paul, in his usual style of writing, he deals with doctrinal issues as well as practical issues, and he usually starts with the doctrine. In the first couple chapters, there's been a lot of doctrine. In chapter 3, we're going to see him start dealing with the practical side of it. Now, good preaching and good teaching will give you the doctrine, but it'll also tell you what to do with that doctrine. Amen? Uh, sin destroys. So what do you do? You, you get saved. You get rid of that sin. Do you see how it tells you what to do? It tells you the steps that you need to take. Uh, there's many today that will stand up and declare the gospel. There's many that will stand up and, and quickly defend the gospel. But there's few today that will demonstrate the gospel. Amen. Uh, and we're going to be dealing with our response to the doctrines that he's taught us. Uh, that'll be verses 1 through 4. Then we'll look at our, look at our response responsibility 5 through 17 and then he'll get into our relationships that'll be 18 through 25 now let's go ahead and just jump in because I don't know how far I'm going to make it tonight before we have to stop I know I'm not going to make it all the way through the chapter <clears throat> would like to but I doubt I'll make it that far number one Roman number one, I guess I should say, for those taking notes, is going to be the response. Uh, look at verse one. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, here we have the response. We're to put away sins and put on Christ. Basically, it's what we're going to learn in this chapter. But I want to give you a couple things about the response. First, our affections. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections. Here's the problem most people have. Set your affections on on things above. People can't get their eyes off of things here and now. They ain't thinking about things above. Uh, when I say set your affections on things above, now, now don't raise your hand, but this is a test that, that I'm going to give you to give yourself. How many of you can think of some things that are above? What should your affections be set on? There's things above you ought to think about. See, most people never think about anything above. They don't even know what's up there waiting for them, amen? Right. We've got the judgment seat of Christ. There's going to be rewards given. There's going to be laws suffered. There's going to be things above that we are to set our affections on, amen? Right. That gives you something to think about, don't it? Amen. Mm. Mm -hmm. But the affections, notice verse 1, it says, if, 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 ye then be risen. If you're saved, you're saved, then if ye be risen with Christ, that's basically saying if, you be, if you're being saved, you should seek those things which are above. Now, uh, that's a spiritual resurrection if you be risen with Christ. Remember, you were dead in your trespasses and sin, 
But he's quickened you. He's made you alive. That's a spiritual resurrection. When you get saved, yeah. born again, made alive, you're placed in Christ, baptized into him, spiritual baptism, of course. Uh, and once that takes place, you're, you're said to be risen with Christ. And once you're risen with Christ, you're to seek to, you're to seek those things which are above. Seek is to look for, to search earnestly. People will seek a dollar. They'll seek pleasure, but they won't seek after the things of God. They won't seek after wisdom or knowledge. They won't seek after righteousness or purity. They won't seek after the things that matter. Mm. Uh, We'll deal with that in just a minute. Well, no, let's just go ahead and hit it. Turn to Matthew. We're, going, we're just going to do what we can do and go to the house. Amen. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I'll get there myself in a second. Matthew 6. Look at verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, mark it, there will your heart be also. Yeah. If your heart is here, your, I mean, if your treasures are here, that's where your heart's going to be. But if your treasure is something over there, that's where you're longing for. Amen? And you can tell what a lot of people uh, put stock in, so to speak. It's here. They, they're working for here, for this life, for now. The very, 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 very few and far between seem to be thinking about eternity with God. Amen? That goes with Colossians 2-3. In Colossians 2 and verse 3, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Yeah. All that we need is in Christ. Yeah. Amen. That's the yeah. greatest treasure. If you're lost, you need Christ. If you're saved, you need Christ. If you're, if you're on the mountaintop, you need Christ. And if you're going through the valley, you need Christ. Yeah. All that we need is found in Him. Amen. Amen. Uh, notice it said He sitteth on the right hand of God. Now the right hand, that phrase is 167 times in the Bible, right hand. And, and most all the time that it's a reference, it's a reference to authority, to power. And Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father in the position of authority, in the position of power. Amen? Now I'm going to show you something interesting. Back in Matthew, Matthew chapter 22, Look at this. You might like this. This is very interesting. May have already caught it. Don't know. I thought it was very interesting. Matthew chapter 22. Look at verse 44. The Lord said to my Lord. What? The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. This is the Lord quoting Psalms, 100, uh, 110th Psalm, verse 1. 110th Psalm, verse 1. He's quoting it. and But notice something here in verse 44. The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, said to my capital L, O-R-D. The first Lord is God the Father. The second Lord is God the Son. So it's right when it says, the Lord said to my Lord, <laughs> amen, said that it's God the Father saying, sit here at my right hand. Again, that goes back with what it says here in Colossians, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, you can find that again in Hebrews 10 and verse 12. In Hebrews 10 and verse 12 uh, in Hebrews, it's a picture of the Lord going in there with His blood, offering that perfect blood sacrifice. Once He made that offering, He sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Amen. The high priest in the Old Testament 
when they went in the temple or the tabernacle and they offered the blood, there was no chair, there was nowhere to sit in the tabernacle or the temple, showing that their work was not finished. But when Jesus offered his perfect blood, shed once and for all, he was able to sit down. Showing his work was finished. Wow. Oh, that's good. So he's seated right now. Somebody says, where's the, where, where's the Lord? He said, beside the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Got it? <laughs> Amen. That's good, ain't it? But anyway, uh, verse 2. We've already commented, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. Uh, Matthew 6, 19 through 21, you could goes with that. But according to Paul, we're to seek the heavenly. That's verses 1 through 4. We're to seek the heavenly. Then we're to slay the earthly. That's going to be verses 5 through 9. And then we're to strengthen the Christly. That would be verses 10 and 11. But many today have it all backwards. Many today, that they seek the earthly and they slay the heavenly. They got it backwards, don't they? You can't have both. It's going to be one or the other. The Lord works it out to where you're either going to worship Him or you're going to turn your back on Him. You, you can't have can't, can't have it both ways. There, there are no fence straddlers. People try and they usually wind up blowing their testimony. Right. Amen. Amen. But anyway, verse 3. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. You're dead. Romans 6 deals with this. Uh, let's just go look at Romans 6 real quickly. Romans 6. Romans 6 deals with this very thoroughly. I'm not going to read it all to you, but I'll give you enough to where hopefully you go home and read it and it'll make more sense to you. Verse 3. Know you not that so many, that so many of us as were baptized unto Jesus Christ were baptized unto His death. That's that spiritual baptism again. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism unto death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There's that new man, that spiritually awakened man. Verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that's the flesh, that the body of sins might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We're to reckon our bodies dead, crucified. We'll see that in a minute in verse 5. Uh, look at verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're to reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive to Jesus Christ. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness and sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servant to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. So it deals with it clearly there. In verse 3, back in Colossians 3.3, 3, For ye are dead, that spiritually you are to consider your body dead. Look at verse 5 and it will show you. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Let you know it's talking about this flesh. When you get saved, you're not supposed to live for the pleasures of the flesh anymore. You're not going around just trying to fulfill the lusts and the desires of the flesh like you did before you got saved. Before you got saved, just whatever the body wanted, you pretty much gave it. Amen? 
If it wanted fornication, you fornicated. If it wanted drinking, you drank. If it wanted drugs, you drugged. If it wanted to uh, overeat, you let it overeat. You didn't try to subdue it. You didn't try to crucify it. Amen. You didn't try to make it behave, if that makes any sense. But once you're saved, you're to reckon it dead. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. As Christ is in the Father, we are in the Son. Amen. He made that plain. But anyway, uh, number two. First was the uh, uh, affections. Now we're going to look at the appearing. Look at this. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now, when Christ returns, when he appears, that'll be the second advent. Because the rapture is private just to those that believe. But when he appears, wherever I shall see him, and, and even those whom pierced him, uh, when he shall appear, it's going to be the second advent, it says we shall also appear with him. Now, how is that going to happen? When the, when the Lord shows up and He appears, how are we going to show up with Him? Unless we already went up with Him. That's a pre-tribulation rapture there. Can you see it? The only way we're going to appear with Him is because we came down with Him. We went up before the tribulation in a private event called the rapture. And then when He comes back publicly and appears before all, guess who's with Him? We are. We're going to appear with him. And then it says in glory. Now, there's two ways you can look at this. It can be taken two ways, but I believe that it means that when Christ comes back, he's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to rule and reign, and he's going to get the glory that is due him. But some also can look at it and say, well, he's going to be in his glorified body. He revealed his glory to his uh, uh, to to uh, Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. It was his glorified body, and we're going to have glorified bodies. So we're going to appear with him in glory in our glorified bodies. So some take it that way. I don't believe it's that way. I believe that it's when Christ sets up his kingdom and sits on the throne that is due him, and he receives the glory and honor that's due him. That's the glory. That's the kingdom of heaven, the millennial reign, okay? Now, Paul switches. Now, that, that was just a little, little more doctrine. Now, Paul's getting ready to switch from that doctrinal mind to that practical. He's going to tell us what we should do and how we should behave in light of the fact that Christ is superior to everything. Amen? So number two, Roman numeral two in your outline, the responsibility. That's going to be verses 5 through 17. I can done tell I probably ain't going to make it that far, but we'll go as far as we can get. Number one, the abolishing. Look at verse five. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is adultery, for which things say the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Mm. Verses 5 and 6, you see the abolishing of something. And what that is, it is to mortify. Mortify. That's uh, where we get our word. It, it, mortify means to reckon dead. That's figuratively to subdue something. You're to mortify. I was mortified. You know, you, that, that's them using that word. Morgue, where dead bodies go. Mortuary, where dead bodies are. Mortal, that's life that is subject to death. Morals, that is the character of the living. Awaiting death. <laughs> Amen. So it has to do with death. Paul deals with the negative first. Have you ever noticed that? He deals with the negative before he gives you the positive. Now, the world's got it backwards. The world wants to do positive, 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 positive. They don't want to hear the negative stuff. But Paul deals with the negative first. And uh, because, because Paul knew that you had to empty the vessel, you had to empty the cup before you could fill it with something else. 
You got to get it rid of the bad before you can let anything good come in. You got to get rid of sin before the spirit will move in. Right. A lot of people with their uh, feel good messages never preach against sin, never step on anybody's toes. A lot of Christians today don't know what it's like to be filled with the spirit because they've never emptied themselves. Pride, selfishness, greed, whatever. They, they don't know it's a sin nowadays. Pride's a sin. A lot of what they're teaching our kids today about ego is right the opposite of what the Bible says. It's right the opposite. Now, I'm not for tearing somebody down, but I'm not going to build them up to something they ain't. Right. Right. Amen? Hmm. Hmm. Some are so full of sin, they don't know what it's like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then, in verse 5, Paul goes on to list some sins that we are to mortify. Here's what we are dealing with. First, fornication. Paul deals with a lot of sexual sins because here in, in Colossae, he's dealing with Gentile converts who are very familiar with sexual sins. So he deals with them. And again, Colossians could be written to America today. Yes. Remember, this book is aimed to be read to the church at Laodicea. Amen. Right. So I believe it's aimed to hit us today. And I believe it does. It does. Why? What's one of the problems, that, one of the real bad problems in America? Fornication. What's the problem in their schools? Fornication. What's the problem in the churches today? Fornication. Amen. Amen. What's the problem in the pulpits? Fornication. Amen. I mean, zipper trouble in every denomination. It's terrible. Right. It's terrible. And Paul, Paul, Paul deals with that. He, he lists fornication. Sexual sin, any sexual activity outside the marriage bond is fornication and sin. Then he lists uncleanness. That's not talking about unbathed. They didn't take a bath. They didn't, they didn't comb their hair and brush their teeth. That uncleanness is talking about moral, morally unclean. This uncleanness is has to do with such sordid sins as homosexuality, lesbianism, transgenderism, cross-dressing, uh, 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 pedophilia, bestiality, all kinds of sexual sins could fall under that. All of which, again, was practiced by these Gentile Colossians before they got saved. They were familiar with this. All of which go on here in America. You know what? It is so twisted and perverted now in America that, that we're even confusing boys and little girls to where they don't even know whether they're a boy or a girl. They're kidnapping women and young girls and boys and putting them in sex trafficking. You say, oh, pressure, pressure. It's in North Carolina. Right. It's everywhere. It don't get the news. Now, you let some white cop kill a black for resisting arrest and shooting at him, that'll be all over the news. But you let some kid get abducted by one of these perverts, and that ain't on the news. That's right. right. Sir. Amen. Yeah. What's wrong? What's wrong with this picture? Right. This is a sin-sick society. Right. Yeah. And the news media is not your friend. They're not helping you. They're not on the right side. They're not. They're not. You can tell by what they cover and what they do not cover. What they emphasize and what they do not emphasize. Now, he goes on and talks about inordinate affection. That's evil desires, depraved passions, wicked lusts. Is that not today? It's just a matter of time that they're going to start hollering they want to lower the age of consent. They've already tried it in some states at 16. 
when a kid's old enough to determine whether or not they want to be sexually active. Evil concupiscence. That's evil and wicked cravings. That's longing for that which has been forbidden. Covetousness. That's greedy desires. Always wanting more and more. And you know that's what sin does. Sin promises you this will be fulfilling. And then when you get it, it just makes you want more of it. And more of it. And more of it. It's never enough. You can't ever get enough alcohol. You can't ever get enough of this drug. You can't ever have this high uh, uh, last long enough. You can't ever have that uh, tingling in the flesh long enough. It promises you all these great things, but it's never enough. Yeah. Always want more and more and more. Got to have more money. Got to have more things. Got to have more power. Got to have more praise, more attention. Always wanting more. That's the way the world and the flesh is. Thank the Lord in Christ Jesus we have all that we need. Amen. He has it all. We don't need anything but Christ. Amen. What a blessing. Idolatry. That's worship of things. Uh, uh, now covetousness is said to be which is idolatry. Now, covetousness, when you long for something, you, you, it's almost like some people worship some of that stuff. They get it and they, 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 they just, that's all they're about. That's all they talk about. That's all they want to do. That's all they think about. It's almost a God tool. Anything you put before God is an idol. It can be a person, a thing. It can be your yard. It can be your house. It can be your car. Anything you put before God's an idol. So number one, we're to abolish some of these things. We're to mortify them. Don't let it be counted once among you, as way it's put in Ephesians. Don't let it be part of you. Amen. Number two, the accompaniment. Look at verse six. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Now, because of those sins, God's wrath, divine judgment, comes. Uh, you either slay sin, or sin will slay you. You either deal with it, or God will. Mm. Notice, both, now, now, let me show you something in Ephesians right quick. Just go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Just a page or two in your Bible. 5 verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And he lists some things there as well. This chapter 5 kind of goes to chapter 4 of, Colossians, of Ephesians. Go before Colossians. Or three of Colossians. But anyway, notice both of them had mentioned the wrath of God. The wrath of God. That's something you don't hear preached today. The wrath of God. You hear a lot about the love of God. The compassion of God. But you hear very little about the wrath of God. So I looked it up. I spent a little time thinking about it. I spent a little time studying it and praying about it and seeing what others said about it. And the wrath of God comes in different categories. The wrath of God can be seen as eternal wrath. Eternal wrath against sin. Eternal wrath. Uh, we know that many will burn in the lake of fire that burneth forever and ever. The smoke of their torment shall go up forever and ever. Why? Because of sin. We, we understand that one. That one's easy God's against it. His wrath is against sin. It was faithful on Calvary, amen, but it's against sin. Then you have the future wrath of God that you can find in the Bible that deals with the, the, the nation of Israel during the tribulation. It deals, with the, uh, it deals with the Gentile nations at the judgment of nations. You can read about the future wrath of God. Revelation 6 through 19. Then you have the calamitous wrath of God. Uh, in Genesis 6 through 9, God caused a flood, a calamity, 
He judged this world. God was sickened by what he saw in Genesis 6. And I'll tell you, I believe that God's sickened at what he sees in 2021. Amen. And so there's his wrath. That's Noah and the flood. Then you have the consequential wrath of God. That that's Genesis or excuse me, Galatians six seven. You reap what you sow. Amen. That's consequential. If you do this, you disobey, then this happens. Then there's one more that I found that, that led me down a path that just just absolutely amazed me what I found. This one, I don't know what to call it. It's not abandonment. It's not forsaken because he said he'd never leave us nor for, forsake us. But it's a standoff wrath. It's where God steps back. This one I will explain. I, I want to give you, give you something to think about now. Also note, I will be giving some illustrations of individuals and nations. God deals with nations differently than individuals. God will judge a nation by what the leaders decide, and he'll ju judge an individual by what that individual, so, uh, uh, that individual seeks. For instance, America can, can, can turn its nose up to God and publicly disavow God and, and outlaw Christianity. God will judge her for that. But me or you as an American, we can turn our heart to God and God will judge us as an individual. We will be under the wrath that America goes, but we will be safe spiritually because we turn individually to Him. Does that make sense? Now, having said that, I want you to really pay attention because what I'm going to tell you, uh, let me just get on into it. Here's some examples of God stepping back or with I don't even like using withdrawal. But but Judges chapter 16, there was a man by the name of Samson. This is his third trip, 1620. This is his third trip, laying his head on the lap of Delilah, messing around with sin. He's confessed where, where he thinks his strength lies, and she cuts his hair off, ties him up. Samson, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. He jumps up, wish not the Lord had departed and his strength was gone. Now, you and I both know his strength wasn't in his hair. The source of his strength was not in his hair. It was just a symbol of his dedication. The fact that he allowed it to be cut off. His, his disdain, his disrespect for that is what caused him to lose his strength. Are you with me? There's, there's something to think about there. But anyway... The Lord departed from him, didn't he? His eyes was put out, he's taken captive, he's mocked, he's, he, he's made to grind and all that stuff. They, they publicly humiliated him and we know the, the Lord came back on him and he died, okay? He, he, he got to die. He killed more Philistines in his death than he did in his life, okay? But God left him. God withdrew himself. He was still there. He still knew what was going on, but he withdrew his hand of protection. He withdrew his hand of provision. He withdrew. He drew back from him. Okay? Proverbs. Look at this one. Proverbs chapter 1. I'm going somewhere with this. It's going to be lengthy, but I, I want to make sure you get where, 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 why I'm going to say what I'm going to say in a minute. Proverbs chapter 1. Oh, we'll start about verse 22, I guess. How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity and the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge? Turn you at my reproof. This is wisdom speaking, but we know wisdom is the Lord. Amen? He says, Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you and I will make known my words unto you because I have called... And ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded, but ye have said it not all my counsel, 
And with none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. He stood back. He stepped back. Are you, are you seeing it? They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproofs. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. So that's almost the consequential wrath as well. He stepped back and let them eat the fruit of their doing. Amen. Yes. That's what he did. Now, in Hosea 4, Hosea 4, Hosea 4, look at verse 7. That was not it. It's 17. Hosea 4, 17. This one, I'm, I'm just going to give it to you and then just maybe have to explain it to you. Ephraim is talking about the northern tribes. Now watch this. Ephraim is joined to idols. Look at the next three words. Scariest words in the whole Bible. That's God talking. Even if he's joined the idols, let him alone. Let him, let him go his way. Let him have what, just let him go. God doesn't wash his hands, but it's like God washed his hands out. Ephraim's turned to idols, let him go. You know what happens to the northern tribes shortly after? Here comes Assyria and wipes them out. Wipes them out. Not carries them out, wipes them out. It's, it's pretty devastating when you study that. But one more. You say, well, all these is Old Testament. All these is Old Testament. One more. And here's going to be the eye opener, maybe for some of you. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. The question is is there a sign that the Lord is a departing? or stepping back, or abandoning a nation. He'll never leave you nor forsake you as an individual, but as a nation, is there any way we can know that if God's stepping back from America, is God stepping back, is He withholding His hand from America? Is there any way we can know that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And the answer is right here. It's homosexuality. Homosexuality is a sign that God has stepped back and allowed Ephraim, let him go. Allowed the flesh to go. If the flesh is allowed to run on, it will turn into perversion. If the flesh is unchecked, it will degenerate and go into wickedness. No question about it. Now, for years, I had Romans 1 wrong. Just being honest with you. I thought the last part of the chapter was dealing with the sin and God's judgment on that wicked sin of homosexuality. But that's not what the passage is about. The passage is about the wrath of God and the consequences of that wrath is homosexuality. Yes. Yes. It is the God stepping back and letting them go. The worst thing God can do to you is just let you have your way. The worst thing an individual can have happen to them is for God to let them have their way. Worst thing you can do for your child is to let it do whatever it wants to whenever it wants to. What will it do? It won't do right, I promise you. Right. What has America done? We haven't done right, I promise you. 
That's something to think about. Now you say, I don't know about that. God was silent for 400 years between the Old Testament and New Testament. What makes you think God might not be getting silent right now? Mm. But yeah, we've got His Word. We can still preach His name. But I'm telling you, I, there's some things I can't preach anymore that I used to. I used to preach, man, I wanted to see revival, man. I wanted to see revival in America. I really did. But you know, I don't, I don't preach that anymore. Why? Because I don't think America's going to turn. I believe the individual can repent. I believe the individuals will repent and will get saved. But stop and think about this. Do you really see America repenting of the sins of homosexuality? <coughs> of the sins of fornication? Of the sins of rejecting the Word of God? I don't see it happening. I don't see it happening. But, but let's keep going. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. God will judge the wicked sin of, uh, of homosexuality, but... Let me prove my point. Now listen, I can't preach this as sound doctrine, bless God, this is the way it is. I'm telling you, this is what I saw. And I'm going to show it to you. You see it for yourself, or you can dismiss it, either one. Okay? I've just honestly seen this this week. And I'm... I, I, I'm I, I, I'm, I, I'm excited. I've got some stuff really I'm studying and going on. But anyway... Romans chapter 1 verse 17. For therein is righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. How are we to live? That wasn't a trick question. <laughs> by faith. We're to live by faith. How do we live by faith? Put our trust in God. We follow God. We do what the Lord tells us to do. We seek His will. We're putting our faith in Him. We're to mortify the deeds of the body. We're to reckon this flesh dead. Right? We've seen that. We know that's how we're to live. Verse 18. For the wrath of God. Now we're getting into the subject again. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who holding the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest. What can be known of God? It's manifest in them, for God has showed it to them. What has He showed them? He showed them He's the Creator. You know what's pretty amazing? Didn't really realize it till this week. Now I know the Bible says repeatedly that God is a jealous God. And that He will not share His glory with any, any, any nation, any body, any entity. He will not share His glory with any. He is a jealous God according to Himself with a godly jealousy. Amen? He, he is a jealous God. And you know how he first appears in the Bible? He first appears as the Creator. Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You go to the middle of the Bible, and you know what you find? You find the heavens declaring the glory of God. Do you know what the first part of Romans 1 is dealing with? How the heavens declare the glory of God, showing that we are by design, not by accident. We have a creator. We didn't just evolve. We didn't just poop. Here we are. Amen. I mean, that's just common sense. I mean, when you stop thinking about it. But God is a creator. And Colossians, we discussed how he created all things and how it was through Jesus Christ. John 1 deals with it. Revelation 4 deals with the fact that we were created for his pleasure. Yeah. He is the creator. And what have we done? We've rejected that. We've come up with a theory called the Big Bang. Darwin's theory of evolution. And we teach that as fact. And we take creation out of schools. We take the Bible out of schools. We take prayer out of schools. Take the name of Jesus out of schools. And we, we're going to follow the science and the data. I like what somebody said this week when it comes to COVID. 
Science has done a lot of things to help us. But science is the problem. Science is what caused this. Right. Have you ever thought about that? Science did this. This wasn't a naturally occurring virus. This was a chemically engineered one. So I'm not putting a lot of faith in science. Amen. Amen. Right. <laughs> Amen. Thank God for it. God shows some men some great things. Amen. But but that my hope, my my hope doesn't rest in science. My hope's in Jesus Christ, who is far better, who never is wrong, who never has to be corrected, who never has to be updated. Amen. Now, yet America rejected him as creator, and they chose science, Darwin's evolution. Yeah. A simple search, and I found that Darwin's theory of evidence, now Darwin was in the late 1800s, early 1900s kind of thing, it was getting big. But when did it really catch on and get widely accepted and published in America? In the 1950s. When did the movement for the homosexuals really catch into gear and catch on in America? In the 1960s. Right after he's rejected as creator, in comes the homosexual movement. In 1969, over in those bunch of Corinthians, Californians, those of you who know what Corinthians is about, a bunch of worldly carnal people understood what I was talking about when I called Californians Corinthians. But anyway, the, over in California, you know what happened? There was some police officers raided right a bar. And they was going to get rid of the sexual deviancy. That's what the newspapers said. Sexual deviancy of homosexuality. It was against the law. They rioted and protested for three days. Shortly, and, and that event in 1969, which is an interesting year, but that event is said to have spurred the, the, the LGBT movement in which we're in today. It was supposed to have been the spark that started the flame that's going across America now. But it didn't start till after evolution crept in, till after he had been rejected as a creator. Now watch, let's keep going, let's keep going. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just spurring because I'm trying to hurry because I know I'm out of time. Uh, notice, notice verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed. Okay, I've already read that one. Let's go down to verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up. Let them alone. Give them up. To uncleanness. Why did He do it? Because verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. There he is again, creator. Who, blessed, who is blessed forever, amen. For this cause. What cause? For rejecting him as creator. Uh, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. He's not punishing them because of the homosexuality. The homosexuality come because he's punishing us by pulling back. When he pulls back, when God was silent, when God gave them up, that's when they went pervert. Even their women did change the natural use to that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves that recompense of their evil, which was meat. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, don't like, to keep, don't like Him in school, do they? God gave them over. Did you notice that? He gave them up in 24. He gave them up. In 26, he gave them over. In 28. Two times he gave them up. The third strike, they're out. What did he give them up to? What did he give them over to? Look at verse 28. 
to a reprobate mind to do the things which are not convenient. Homosexuality is a sign that God had pulled back. A sign that God was judging them. Can you see it? How many of you see what I'm talking about now? The way I'm, you can. I, I know it's hard. Uh, because of what we've been taught, the way we've seen it all our lives, but man, it's clear as a bell to me. He gave them up to a reprobate mind to do the things. What things? Those perverse homosexual things he just listed in verse 27. So, again, homosexuality is a sign that God is in the process of giving up America. Yeah. Or giving them over. That's right. I don't know if we're in the first give them up, or excuse me, the second give them, give them up, or if we've already reached the give them over. The way the laws is passed and the way the homosexuals are pushing, we ain't far from giving over if we ain't done being give over. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's something to think about. Now again, I want to re-emphasize individuals can repent and be saved. Individuals can turn their hearts to God and repent of their sin and God will forgive them. God will save their soul. But nationally, as a nation, I think we're in trouble. Yes. I hope I'm wrong. I hope God would give us national repentance and that we would see what Jonah saw in Nineveh. But I'm not holding my breath. All this craziness, all this stupidity, all this insanity that's going on today, it's simply God stepping back and saying, Ephraim's been given to idols. Let him, let him alone. Yes. Let him go. Yes. America, if God pulls back on us, you know what's going to happen? You know what's going to happen? We're going to destroy ourselves with sin. Your kid will destroy his life if you don't take control and govern it when they're little. They'll destroy themselves. They'll kill, they'll kill themselves. They'll cut their life short. They'll do stupid stuff. They'll try stuff they ought not to, and they'll wind up killing themselves. Guess what America's going to do without God? Guess what America's doing right now? Critical race theory. June team. Whatever that is. All this craziness, this stupidity, putting people against each other, baiting race against race. That's all that is. The homosexuality movement, the, I mean, kids not even knowing if they're a boy or a girl, kids getting to decide whether they keep their boy parts or, or do away with their boy parts or girl parts. This is crazy and it's right. insane. Right. It's godless. Right. Almost as if God give them over. Let them go. You don't see, you don't hear a lot of people preaching against it anymore. You used to, they used to preach against it. Hey, listen, I was studying, and I seen where in the 50s they had laws where you couldn't be a homosexual and work for the federal government in any position. You couldn't be a dog catcher if you was a homosexual. Had laws against it. Now there's laws to protect them. What I'm doing right now could be considered hate speech. Punishable by the law. And I'm simply preaching the truth. Man lost his job. Told you about it Sunday night, I believe it was. Man lost his job because he refused to, to not to call a boy a boy when he wanted to be recognized as a her or a them or an it or whatever. Just crazy, stupid stuff going on today. It's godless. It's godless. But anyway, it, it's 808. How many of you have seen what I was talking about? Now, would I call that a sound doctrine? I think it's pretty sound, but I'm not going to push it. Amen. But I will say this. I think there's something there. And the reason it may be able to be seen today is because we got 2020 hindsight. We can look back and see when all this 
homosexual stuff started, we have the we have we can see what happened in America as this stuff went through, and we're the place now. What's so bad? The fact we can see it might be a sign in itself that we're too far gone. Mm, as a nation, as a nation. Well, here's Christian's attitude. Well, today's a Christian attitude. Well, I've still got money in the bank. I've still got food on the table. I'm going to be all right. Yeah. That's what Ephraim said. That's what the northern tribe said until one day Assyria came in. Right. Everything can be hunky-dory and good and well. And the fact that God is patient and taking his time the devil only lulls more people asleep. More Christians asleep. Clueless to what's going on. Listen, America is a great nation. But you take China, and they're coming up fast, and there's no one stopping them. You take China, China can take us. Right now under this administration, and once China rises up, guess who's going to jump right in behind them? Here comes the bear. Russia's going to jump right in there. Or you let Russia jump on us, and I guarantee you China will back them. We have no allies anymore. We've turned our back. We're turning our back on Israel under this administration. And every time that's happened, something's happened to America. Amen? It's just a matter of time. We're no better than Israel. If God gave his people up to their enemy to chastise them, to correct them, to try to turn them, what makes you think that he wouldn't do the same to America? I am a patriot. I love our flag. I think anybody disrespects the flag ought to be drug out in the street and shot publicly. I'll pay for the bullet. Out of my pocket, I'll pay for the bullet. If they'll do it. Amen. Government, not you and you, you know, it, it ought to be a law. You can't do it. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Now, having said that, some of the patriotism that's going on today is nothing more than idols. Shame on you if you'll brag on your nation and you won't brag on your Savior. Shame on you if you'll display the American flag, but you won't talk about the Lord and get somebody to try. Right. What a lot of people call patriotism, God looks at it as idol, idol worship. You've deified America above Him. You put more emphasis in that than you do him. Now, now, you say, preacher, you're going overboard now. Oh, man, preacher. No, no, listen, listen. I know I preach patriotic messages in, in the 4th of July. I know I stand firm. I, I love my country. No, no question about it. But I love the Lord more. And if the Lord wants to come and he wants to destroy this thing, he would so come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Because Amen. I know one day it's going to burn all of it. Amen. Boy, that'll win me a popularity contest, won't it? All right. Well, let's all stand. I'll, 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 I'll quit going. i can get to ranting and raving. I thought that was interesting. Hey, Amen. We'll, we'll take a... Let me mark where we were because I'll forget. All right. We'll take up there in verse 7 next... Not next week. The week after. Next week is... Vacation Bible School. <laughs> Amen. Woo! Y'all got to get pumped up. There's something wrong with you. These kids are going to kill you next week if you don't pump up a little bit. Amen. You better have some energy next week. Get up, drink your coffee. Say, I don't do caffeine. You better start. Amen. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, we need you and we need all the energy we can get, all the prayers we can get. Amen. You're at work and it crosses your mind. Say, Lord, please bless. Please please move in. Please save them. Lord, if there's a prodigal son or daughter, come through the door, speak to their heart, get them to uh, come to themselves and realize their mistake. Because I'm telling you, that's you want to win America, I'll tell you how to do it. One soul at a time. Amen. Amen.
If it can be won, that's how to be won. All right. Amen. All right. We're going to be dismissing a word of prayer. Uh, again, I appreciate your indulgence in letting me rant just a little bit. But I think I have enough Bible that, 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 that we shot that rabbit. Amen. I think I think I don't think I chased him too long before we shot him. All right, Brother Louis, if you would please dismiss us. I'll probably thank you tonight for